So my name is Gabor Messarsch. I'm from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences, Vienna. And on the bottom right side of the screen, you might see a small logo saying EMABG, and that is our uh, international master program called European Master in Animal Breeding and Genetics, which is the co-organizer of this uh, of this webinar. So I am uh, really happy that the uh, uh, our, our friends and colleagues from the FABR and uh, Gene Switch uh, are kind of uh, contributing to our uh, to our efforts and basically that we are making these joint uh, joint webinars. So a very short uh, thing about EMABG. Well, it's an international master program of six partner universities. That is University of Göttingen, Wageningen University, uh, the uh, Swedish University of uh, well, I messed up, but SLU in Sweden and MBU in uh, Norway and uh, Agroparitech paris saclay in France and Boku in uh, Austria, Vienna. So uh, we are dealing with, uh, well, as the name says, animal breeding and genetics in a two-year master program, which is basically open for all. So if you or any or uh, anyone who is interested uh but anyone you know is interested, then of course you are uh, welcome to welcome to join or kind of uh, well uh, check out what it is, and uh, then then we, we might uh, welcome you among our ranks. So there is a website that tells everything. That is the emabg.eu, and well, basically there is uh, everything, including the study program, including the curriculum, and including all the other criteria that need to be fulfilled in case you would like to well, just uh, uh, apply or uh, to, 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 to the master program. So I, I think that would be kind of a brief uh, brief introduction from my side. And uh, well, I'm excited to, to, to see and hear what's going to happen uh, for, this, for, this, for this webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabor. So also from, from my side, from FOP and uh, the Gene Switch project, I'm happy to welcome you to the second edition of, uh, of the webinars from the series Decoding Genome in Monocastrix. Um, today we are going to focus on uh, genomic prediction. Um, but before we do that, I also have a few slides on um, FOP, the European Forum of Farm Animal Readers. So we are the voice of animal breeders in Europe, and we do that in multiple ways. Um, as you can see here on screen, we are involved in European research projects in different species. Uh, for instance, as we are here today for the webinar in uh, collaboration with GeneSwitch, um, who works on poultry and pigs. We have a similar project, Geronimo, that also works on poultry and pigs, and um, PigWeb, who focuses mainly on pigs. Uh, for you as early careers as the early career scientists presence here today might be of interest we have a pick web junior community um i will probably send it to, to you in the chat in the meanwhile um and we also have projects focusing on aquatics and um, we're also moving into the insect area um oh that didn't go to plan did it Uh, where is my right screen? There we are. Yes. So next to the European form of uh, farm animal breeders part, we also have the Faber TP technology platform. This is the tool um, in which we collect the voices of research institutes and academia, including the FOP members, which are, for instance, breeding companies and universities, to actually um, uh, proceed to include our voice in the policy decisions made in the European Union. Um, so that's also part of what we do. Um, then for today, we have some house rules. Um, so when you're not talking, I would like to ask you to please mute your microphone. Um, and if you have any questions to the speakers um, or you would like to contribute to the panel discussion, either re raise your hand from the reactions or ask a question in the chat box. You can see here on screen how that's done. Um, and you probably already received a notification when you opened this meeting, but the webinar is recorded and we will share it on our social media and website. Um, by being here, you agree to that. Um, so if you don't agree, <laughs> this is probably a cue to leave. Um, and if you have any technical issues, you can report them through the chat box or send an email to my colleague uh, Maria Ramirez and our email address is here on screen. So 
take note of that. And um, then we also have here the agenda for today. So, um, well, we've already uh, started on the welcome, of course. Um, in a minute, we'll start with the first presentation, Use of Functional Annotation and Other Omics in Genomic Prediction by Mario Kales from Wageningen University. After that, we will move to a presentation by Bruno Perez from Hendrix Genetics. Um, he will talk about validating the prospects of functional annotations in genomic prediction in pigs. And finally, we will go to the presentation by Andrea Rau. She will um, tell us about the accounting for predicted vari variant effects in genomic prediction in poultry. Um, I think we will focus the discussion mostly at the end, but if there are some questions in between, that really need to be answered immediately, we can accommodate that. That's not going to be a problem. Um, and then as a final slide, before we move to the actual presentations, I want to make sure you don't forget that we'll have another webinar coming up in this series about epigenetics, and it will take place on the 15th of May. If you haven't registered yet, um, please do so now. And then I think this was my last slide. Oh. I have one more. Um, so today you will hear a lot about the results and uh, the research done within the Gene Switch project. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about what the Gene Switch project does, uh, please stay in touch. You can see here uh, the Gene Switch coordinator and also Gabor, your email address is also here. Um, so follow uh, EMABG also online and the Gene Switch project for our results. And then I'm now going to give the floor to the first presenter, Mario. Okay, thank you. You should be able to see that now. Yeah, it's all um, working. Perfect. Yeah, so today I'd like to share a bit of on our of our work, particularly within the context of the gene switch project uh, related to using functional annotation, but also other omics in, in genomic prediction. So just briefly, I presumably most of you know what genomic prediction is, uh, but the idea is that let's say here we have a litter of pigs uh, and at a very young age, uh, in the past they would pretty much all be the same individuals to us. We, there wouldn't be any way in terms of breeding values to distinguish between them uh, to decide at an early age which ones to keep for a selection purposes. With genomic prediction, what we do, we sample the DNA from each one of them. We kind of build a DNA fingerprint, a profile, and based on that, we can directly predict uh, a so-called genomic breeding value so let's say in this uh, example, we are interested in number of piglets that uh, might be produced by these pigs as an adult. And then in this case, we, we get those values here. And if we would do selection based on this, uh, we would probably select the ones that are uh, above average in terms of their breeding value or the 10% best animals uh, or whatever your selection criterion is. So, um, this property of being able to select at very young age without requiring to phenotype the animals themselves has uh, very early on spiked the interest in genomic prediction, both from a research as a uh, breeding practice perspective. This is reflected here uh, in this graph where you see uh, papers presented at the World Conference of Genetics Applied to Livestock Production, which is being held every four years and last year we had the pleasure to host it here in the Netherlands in Rotterdam. So there's two groups of papers, then blue the bars indicate the proportion, the to proportion, total proportion of papers of the entire conference that were dedicated towards the GWAS and QTL mapping, which have made a very steady contribution in the last 30 years. But there you can see that the red bars um, showing the, the contribution for genomic prediction they uh, have been steadily increasing since uh, 2010, and they're sort of now stabilizing at a 
well, anywhere between 10 and 50% of the papers and is now being more important as a topic than uh, uh, GWAS and QTL mapping. So uh, in principle, what we do in genomic prediction is we, we have an observation of the genotypes of individuals and we have observations on phenotypes, could be any kind of trait we're interested in, let's say a growth or feed efficiency, and we make a, a linear predictor from the genotypes towards uh, those phenotypes. But uh, given that we know a little bit more about biology, uh, this may seem like an oversimplification of things. Uh, translation of DNA to phenotypes is not a very linear process. Um, in fact, uh, if we go from uh, the DNA um, all the way to it being transcribed, uh, there's a lot of different steps. The DNA is being folded, there's a methylation, some parts of the uh, DNA is open to be read from, others are not. So there's a lot of um, information that we are completely ignoring in, uh, in genomic prediction, basically. So a question is whether if we have a handle on this information, could we do an even better job? So by far and large, there's, as I can see, as I see it, there's two different approaches to try and use this uh, intermediate omic information in genomic prediction. Uh, in the project gene switch, the approach that we're taking is that um, several uh, uh, different assays are being uh, generated uh, to reflect certain omics data. Um, that's part of the project. And the other part of the project is then that we use this translated information, that the information is translated in functional annotation. So it says something about particular parts of the genome. And then uh, we are building models uh, that use this functional annotation and genomic prediction. In a related project where I'm also involved in called uh, Geronimo, the approach taken is a bit different. So with gene switch, uh, you could say that functional annotation is sort of measured at a population level. We, um, we, we measure certain things and we assume that this applies to all individuals in the population. And, and Geronimo, we measure the other omics at an individual level. Uh, they were actually particularly interested in methylation uh, data. And then we include this individual level data as additional predictors uh, in our genomic prediction. Uh, models. So just to talk you through both approaches, uh, first of all, if we do genomic prediction, we need to have a so-called reference population where we have a bunch of individuals. And from these individuals, we need to know their genotypes. So we need to get a handle on the DNA and we need to have phenotypes. And then we can combine the two to get to build genomic breeding values. So if uh, we're now going to use uh, function annotations uh, in this process, um, what this function annotation will tell us is which part of the genome may be particularly relevant in uh, explaining particular phenotypes. So we put, based on, on this information, we may shift emphasis from uh, across the entire genome more focused to, to specific regions on the genome. So that's uh, using the function anno annotations. In contrast, if we use the other omics, um, in addition to having uh, the genotypes of the individual, we get some source of other omics. So it could be micro, uh, uh, a handle on the microbiome, or it could be gene expression of the individuals. Um, any or methylation profiles. And then we include those next to the genotypes in our, in our models. So uh, the new models that are being built in gene switch, well, before or in current practice, genomic prediction is, um, uh, uses 50,000 SNPs. And then we assume in our models that every SNP explains uh, one fifty thousandth part of the total genetic variance. So we we just assume that every bit of the genome has an equal effect on, uh, on the genomic breeding values. And with the models we are 
uh, testing currently, we try to uh, relax this assumption and with the functional information, we put more emphasis on, uh, on certain regions than on others. In the Geronimo project, um, uh, again, the starting point in the models is using only genotypes, but then we supplement those with other omics like uh, methylation uh, to mediate the, the genotype, the effect of the genotypes towards their phenotypes. Uh, and this particular, particular aim of this project is to use individual methylation to uh, improve genomic prediction. So uh, going back to gene switch, uh, I'm involved uh, together with the other speakers today in uh, work package four, where we aim to, to build those new models. So initially we have genotypes and phenotypes that feed into the genomic prediction models. We supplement this here with functional annotation maps coming from work package one and two. Uh, we work both with pigs and poultry. In poultry, we are supplementing the information with fine map QTL based on a very long-term experiment, selection experiment. And in pigs, uh, eQTL have been mapped within the project that are also included in here. And then we have, um, two types of validation. For the pigs, we have a so-called level one validation where we have 300 pigs with whole genome data and RNA-seq. And Bruno will tell you more about this. Uh, and then both for the pigs and the poultry, we have a level two validation where we validate, we're going to validate these models uh, at a industry scale, uh, large uh, data sets. So, Earlier on in the project, what we started to look into is um, uh, the use of uh, machine learning models rather than linear models. So apply genomic prediction models in practice, they're all linear models. Um, but if in reality, the translation of genotypes to phenotypes is more complex, uh, the expectation is that machine learning uh, could provide a additional uh, accuracy. So this is a work that we've done together with uh, Gary Churchill from the Jackson lab. And we've been using data from mice that was generated within their lab. And this has been published in G3 last year. So in this data, what did we have available? Um, we had a, a, um, a bunch of mice with uh, phenotypes for many different traits, but also genotypes. And here I'm showing on the y-axis prediction accuracy uh, for seven different traits. These traits are fairly known to be fairly polygenic. So whenever attempts were made to map QTL, there weren't very clear, or at, at least not many clear large peaks. So the, the idea is that there's a lot of genes of small effect underlying those traits. Um, Bruno did the, the analysis on this data and used two different models, the linear G blood model and a GBM machine learning model. And what you can see from the plot here is that for these polygenic traits, uh, in all cases, GBLUB uh, performed as well as GBM or outperformed uh, GBM. In contrast, we had a limited number of traits that were known to be under considerable uh, epistatic control. And for those traits, uh, we saw that the machine learning models were able to actually get a, a higher accuracy than GBLOB. So their ability to model interactions uh, between, the, between the genotypes, however implicit, um, seems to give them a benefit for these traits uh, that are known to be affected by epistatic interactions. Then we did a follow-up study on partly the same data. Uh, in this case, uh, we additionally had also in, uh, individual gene expression measured from these animals. So here I'll be showing uh, examples for body weight measured at 10, 15, and 20 weeks of age. And we had individual level gene expression measured in the liver at 26 weeks of age. This work also has been published in G3 last year as well. So, what I'm showing here is the percentage of variance explained uh, on the y-axis in uh, body weight measured at 10, 15, or 20 weeks of age, uh, when we only include SNP information in the model. And you can see that those heritabilities, there are about 40% at all three different time points. 
then if we include only gene expression in the model, uh, the first thing to notice here is that actually we explain almost twice as much of the phenotypic variants are with the SNP genotypes alone. Uh, and the other point is that if we get closer to the 26 weeks of age where gene expression was measured, the more phenotypic variance in the phenotypes uh, was explained, which biologically makes sense. And then finally, we combined the two in the model where we actually uh, conditioned the um, uh, gene expression on the SNP genotypes such that the SNP genotypes still explain the same amount of variance as what they did when include it alone in the model. But then on top of that, uh, we more or less saw the same uh, benefit from uh, using the, the gene expression data. So uh, take home messages from my presentation today. Um, they're split across three different parts. Uh, across the presentation. If we are uh, purely interested in prediction accuracy, then uh, for really polygenic traits, we found that uh, a straightforward linear GBLOP approach uh, yields the highest accuracy. However, if traits are known to be under epistatic control, and I guess particularly if you're interested in predicting phenotypes rather than uh, breeding values, you may want to consider uh, using machine learning models because they may give you a higher prediction accuracy. Um, when using individual level uh, gene expression and prediction models, uh, we saw that those actually explain more phenotypic variants than SNP geno genotypes did. Uh, and also we got a higher prediction accuracy with them. I didn't show these results, but this is what our study showed as well. Um, that's all very nice also from a research perspective, but in terms of implementation, we think that current costs and also sampling complexity, you know, uh, with, from which tissue are you going to measure gene expression at what time during the day or during a growth curve, for instance, um, that's, there's a couple of questions there and quite some costs involved that may prohibit implementation at this moment in time. But yeah, costs are falling. So maybe at some stage, this, is, uh, this will become interesting. Then finally, in terms of added value using annotation and genomic prediction, um, we expect this to be most helpful when we're using whole genome sequence uh, genotype resolution so that we can uh, pinpoint an annotation very clearly. Uh, and we think from the work that we've done so far that will also be presented in the next presentations that it's important to actually integrate all these different annotation maps, because before you know, you can have a very long list of them. So that's what I had to share today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if all goes well. Oh, I have some technical issues on my side at the moment, but um, thank you so much, Mario, for your presentation. Um, I think we have some time for questions right now, if there are any. So if anyone has already a burning question for Mario, the floor is yours. You're also welcome to, uh, to speak up. Gabor, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, just a quick question. Uh, so basically, I was just a bit, uh, uh, well, basically on this slide. So Mario, you were telling that, uh, so the machine learning is especially better if you are uh, predicting phenotypes uh, as opposed to breeding values. I'm just, my question would be, why would you predict phenotype. So aren't the breeding values better by default because these are the, the ones that you, it's kind of they're kept in breeding and the, the goal of breeding? Um, or is that something very, something specific with the phenotypes or some specific phenotypes that you had in mind? It, uh, of course, it depends on what, what your goal is. I mean, from a breeding uh, program perspective, you would be primarily interested in uh, breeding values. I agree. Uh, but given that uh, costs of um, uh, genotypes are falling, 
uh, maybe in the future it's um, people want to think about let's say even genotyping crossbred animals uh, crossbred production animals and then if we could predict their their phenotypes uh, we may be able to based on that sort them according to level of feeding that they needed or something like this right yeah. so it's if you think about how to use this more in terms of animal husbandry rather than breeding this could potentially be interesting yeah. oh excellent okay i didn't thought about this uh, this aspect thank you very much we also have a question in the chat from isabella does the heritability and the nqtl matter between the two approaches the wait the heritability of what was the other thing i can read it myself. can also see, yeah maybe it's helpful uh it's always good to see it so yourself too. Uh, well, I guess if uh, if there's fewer QTL underlying the trait, or there's a number of QTL of larger effect, this could be where the function annotation could be particularly relevant because it could probably help to uh, put more emphasis on those regions. Uh, in which those QTLs are residing. For the heritability, uh, I'm not really sure. Maybe if the heritability is low, the other omics approach could give some additional handle on on variation that we don't easily get with the SNP genotypes. Okay, thank you so much. Any more questions for the moment? If not, then we are going to move to our second presentation, and then we can have uh, a little bit more discussion at the end. Uh, thank you so much, Mario. So then we'll be moving to Bruno. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Not in presentation mode yet. Yeah, now it's perfect. OK, there good. Go. Well, the floor is yours, Bruno. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, maybe a brief presentation. Uh, from my side, my name is Bruno. Uh, I work as a geneticist uh, at Hendrix Genetics, uh, which is a, a multi-species breeding company. Uh, and then I'm going to present some of the results that we have been um, working on uh, and studies related to, to gene switch. And it's all about the validation of, uh, well, applying functional annotation into uh, genomic prediction in pigs. Um, so Mario already showed this slide, but just to locate you uh, of what I'll be talking about. So I'll be presenting results from uh, two studies and a half, and, and one that's undergoing, uh, but they are related to level one and level two uh, validation uh, within the gene switch uh, context. So just to start with, um, so I also here presenting, uh, representing a, a breeding company. So it's, it's good to give some context on uh, the breeding company perspective on how function notation could, uh, could be useful. Uh, so what you look at uh, is the breeder's equation, um, pretty famous. Uh, and and for a breeding company, um, well, it's, it makes sense that it's a it's really relevant for us, uh, and mainly because uh, while the object of of breeding uh, and of course for a breeding company, genetic gain is what uh, generates revenue. So if you're working in a breeding company, uh, you're either directly or indirectly uh, working towards generating more genetic gain on the next generation increasing the average genetic uh, merit of our animals. Uh, and you will be, again, directly or indirectly working on one of these parameters uh, that, that will control genetic gain. And when we talk about functional annotation and how this, uh, we, well, what we expect to get from uh, including functional annotation, so adding biological information to our prediction models, uh, then we're talking about uh, increasing accuracy of prediction from our breeding values. Right. Um, and what will, of course, what we expect when we increase accuracy will be increasing genetic gain uh, and generating uh, revenue. 
just expand a little bit more on uh, accuracy of predictions, uh, maybe on a time scale. If we put, uh, if, if you go back in time, um, well, animal breeding started with uh, using pedigree uh, and phenotype information to estimate genetic merit from animals. And maybe a decade ago, uh, we started to derive relationships, of, uh, genetic relationships between animals from genotypes, genetic markers spread throughout the whole genome. Uh, and this, uh, well, with, with commercial SNP arrays, uh, with around 50K SNP uh, markers, we could uh, improve accuracy of uh, breeding values from a certain range between 10 and 50%, depending on your breeding design, depending on your population, and the trait of interest, et cetera, uh, which was quite a big increase compared to only using pedigree relationships. Uh, so once, once we had genotypes, uh, a natural next step was, uh, okay, what if we uh, impute these genotypes uh, because it's uh, also more cost uh, effective. Uh, if we can improve, uh, oh, sorry, increase the number of markers to the millions, for example, and then we could cover, uh, let's say, uh, smaller chunks of the, of the DNA, capture more genetic variants, and then maybe this could uh, lead to more accuracy in predictions. Uh, and once uh, studies starting coming out, we see that there is not well, such a big jump uh, going from, from SNP arrays to whole genome sequence. Uh, although the cost increases quite a lot. Uh, then um, a next step on that, and, and some people may argue, okay, maybe we have too many predictors. Uh, this is uh, also including a lot of noise. So what if we could also inform the model uh, prior to a genetic evaluation? Uh, what are the, re the regions that are really relevant uh, to the phenotype of interest. And, and, and that's when uh, annotations uh, come into place. And we can imagine two ways uh, we could work with annotations. One would be using individual maps, for example, methylation states, uh, maybe EQTL maps. Uh, and then uh, this also adds a lot of complexity because now you, you're working with uh, individual maps. They may or not, may not be related, and there's also a lot of challenges on how to put this all together. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, in one of our studies. Uh, and of course, one other option I'm also going to touch upon that is well, what if we have integrated scores in a way that we have a way to rank our our uh, genetic variants uh, according to their informativeness, well, the value of their uh, functional uh, information. And then uh, we could attribute these scores to every variant on, on uh, our SNP panel or, or whole genome sequence level uh, and try to increase prediction. But maybe on uh, the implementation uh, side, this uh, red interrogation mark would be the most interesting. Can we also do that to improve, uh, use function annotation to improve prediction accuracies from uh, well, genomic prediction using SNP arrays. Um, yeah. Okay, so I will start with the study from a master's student from Wageningen. Uh, she worked with us uh, here at Hendrix. Uh, and her main question was, what's, what, what would be the value of adding different sources of information into genomic prediction? Well, prediction of, of uh, breeding values in general. And she worked in three main tasks. First one uh, was the value of genomic prediction. So going from pedigree blob to genomic blob. Uh, second topic on, okay, what if we increase then the number of markers? And on the third question, uh, what if we include uh, annotation data? And in this case, uh, pig cat scores. I'm gonna detail them a little bit. Um, and then, well, how do we use this, uh, this function annotation in this sense? Because these are blood models. Uh, we basically derive, well, we have scores, and we use them as uh, weights to weight the relationship between individuals. So the data that she uh, used for that, um, she mainly used one of our uh, lines, data from one of our lines, a land race line. She had around 25,000 animals genotyped with the uh, 50K SNP panel. 
uh, and also she had uh, all these animals imputed to whole genome sequence, so around 15 million SNPs using a reference uh, of 100 animals. The phenotype data, she used six traits of interest uh, between production traits uh, and meat quality traits, uh, but also I think reproductive traits. Uh, and again, the functional notation that we use were uh, pig cat scores. And just to elaborate a little bit more on that, uh, on the right, you see the publication that drives the scores. Uh, in practical terms, a high PCAT score uh, points to a, a, a higher probability of a deleterious variant. Um, okay, so then uh, answering question one, what's the uh, value of adding genotype information? What you see, uh, well, if we use uh, pedigree uh, plus, uh, uh, 50k SNP data to do to do prediction in the, in the traits uh, that we were working with, uh, and if we use this as a benchmark, uh, the columns on the table you see they show percentage wise what's the increase or decrease compared to the well, to the benchmark, and you see that uh, from pedigree information to uh, pedigree plus genotypes uh, there is a, a, a well an increase. So if you don't use genotypes, you would be using, uh, you would be losing 40% uh, of accuracy. So it, it shows clearly the advantage of genotyping our animals. So when she moved on to tackle the second question, and here again, you see the, uh, the predictive accuracies um, for, for uh, pedigree, models using pedigree plus uh, SNP data, and now using pedigree and whole genome sequence level uh, genotype data. And you see that, well, again, if we use uh, pedigree plus SNP data uh, as a benchmark, then now results are a little bit more uh, inconsistent. Some traits like FCI will uh, show an increase of 5% of uh, predictive accuracy, but some other traits show actually a decrease. So although you're increasing the number of variants, you're decreasing your predictive accuracy. So overall, on average, there was no gain, or at least a consistent gain across uh, the traits analyzed. Uh, then she moved on to the third question, uh, which was, okay, uh, what if we inform the model uh, with prior biological knowledge? The table on, on left, you see the benchmarks, so pedigree plus SNP data. The column on the right, uh, right beside it, uh, includes results for the model using pedigree data. SNP data and uh, functional annotation uh, as scores. And you see that, again, we don't, uh, we didn't observe an increase of prediction. And on the table on the right, uh, you see the pedigree plus uh, whole genome sequence and also the far right column uh, using functional annotation on top of that. Uh, and similar to what we saw for using whole genome sequence only, the compared to using 50k SNPs uh, and pedigree information, results are not consistent uh, across traits. So there would be some traits that we have an increase, some traits that had actually a decrease uh, in predictive accuracy. Uh, so a next study now on uh, the first level of validation. Uh, in this study, we we had uh, methylation states for. Uh, for different variants uh, on the genome. Uh, and considering that methylation can affect uh, gene expression, uh, and we also had gene expression on the same animals, uh, a question that rose was, okay, can, can we use methylation information to improve prediction using SNP data uh, uh, of, of gene expressions of certain genes? And that's what we tried to tackle. Uh, in relation to the data, uh, so the genotype data we used were 300 pigs, uh, 100 Duroc, 100 Landrace, 100 large white from three different populations. Uh, they all had a whole genome sequence. We used gene expression from 10 preselected genes uh, as phenotype data, uh, and these were 10 genes uh, with expression in three different tissues, so liver, duodenum, and muscle. And the function annotation we used, as I mentioned, we, uh, we used methyl methylation states. Uh, 
which were also measured on, on the same tissues, but in two different time stages, at embryo stage, at a newborn stage. Uh, we pre-selected SNPs uh, placed on regulatory regions, and then we derived methylation scores from the methylation states uh, for each variant. And similar to what uh, Sophie did, we used this information, methyl these methylation scores, to weight uh, relationship between individuals for prediction. Uh, okay, so I'm going to show uh, just uh, one example. So a pr prediction accuracy for the gene expressions on liver tissue, so 10 genes in, in, uh, in liver tissue. Uh, and uh, if, if our expectation is correct, so if we, uh, if, if function notation from methylation actually brings value to doing better prediction of gene expressions, uh, then we would expect that methylation on liver tissue would overcome uh, other types of models, either not using any weights and no, no, not using function notation or using function notation from different tissues. Uh, and the results uh, as they are, so on the, on the x-axis, you see the traits, which are our genes in this, in this case. Uh, and on the y-axis, you see the prediction accuracy uh, with each model. Um, and across, uh, across the traits, across the genes uh, and tissues, you will see that uh, there is no uh, overall improving prediction. So I, I, I'm using arrows just to point out some cases in which uh, the yellow bars are not uh, higher than, uh, well, the other models. We are not achieving high predictive accuracy from using methylation on the liver when compared to using either no methylation or, uh, or methylation from different tissues. Then um, from these results, we decided to tackle a different scenario. Uh, so for, and that was a cross breed prediction. So we had three different breeds um, and, and the main, uh, the target for it was, okay, so genetic prediction across breeds is limited by how genetically different uh, the breeds are. So the question was, can we use methylation information to help uh, overcome this, uh, this limitation to informing the model using prior uh, knowledge uh, to inform the model what regions should be uh, more relevant. And for that, we designed a validation scheme uh, in which two breeds were used as a reference, as a training population, and a third breed uh, as, a, as validation. In this case, we had three possible scenarios, two breeds on the reference, one breed at, the, at validation. Uh, and again, I'm going to show results on one of the scenarios. They're all pretty similar in, in, in behavior. So if you consider a training set, a reference set containing land race and large white animals and doing, making predictions for a validation set comprised of, of Duroc animals, and again, if our expectation is correct, that's what we would uh, uh, expect. Uh, well, uh, seeing the results, uh, liver methylation being able to uh, inform the model, what are the, uh, the, the, the informative regions, let's say. Uh, oops, oh, sorry. Then I'm, I'm just showing results now for gene expressions in the liver. And you see that now prediction accuracy across breeds uh, delivers a, uh, well, that there's really no pattern. Uh, so prediction, predictive accuracy is still deteriorated. Uh, even when we use uh, functional annotation from the same liver, from the same tissue as the gene expression uh, was measured. And this was also the case when we go to gene expressions in muscle and also uh, gene expressions at, uh, at duodenum. So again, uh, we could not find uh, well positive, favorable patterns when using functional notation uh, to predict gene expressions. Um, so uh, after that, uh, we covered okay using uh, one layer of functional notation. But Mario already mentioned in his presentation that from our results, and and you can see it from our results. Uh, that uh, integrating these layers, these multiple layers of function notation that are available should be the, uh, the way to go. So that's where we uh, arrived at, at FED scores. So this, these FED scores were not uh, created by us. 
uh, the works already uh, published, and you can see the, the paper from 2019. So uh, the FAT score stands for functional and evolutionary trait heritability. So it, it's a way to rank the variants according to uh, how much information they bring, how much variance they can explain uh, for, for, well, any amount of phenotypes that you have available and, and function notation layers. So it's pretty much an accumulation of uh, how informative the, the variant is across many traits and function notation layers. Uh, sorry, and then, then well, the paper was uh, published in, in Cattle and we decided to pursue a similar approach, but with pigs using the same uh, data that we've been uh, working with. So I'm, I'm not I, I'm not going to show uh, predictive accuracies just because this is an ongoing project for now. So we are just starting the project, uh, the analysis. But the data we used is similar to to what Sophie's uh, work used. So whole genome sequence for 25,000 animals, six traits. Uh, and just to start with, we use nine different function notation layers. Uh, you don't need to. Uh, to try to understand them now. So know that there are nine different function notation layers. And the graph on the right, uh, on the well, y-axis now, you see the function notation layers. Uh, and on the x-axis, you see the per SNP heritability. So we're basically estimating a proportional portion of variance explained by a SNP contained in a set, uh, well, pointed out as relevant for a certain uh, functional annotation map. Then we can calculate it per variant. Uh, and, and this is just to illustrate that different functional annotations have uh, across multiple traits, have uh, different, well, will bring different amounts of uh, information value uh, for the analysis. Um, yeah, that's it for, for the studies. So just take home messages for uh, my talk. So for, for the integration of uh, biological knowledge into uh, genomic prediction models, we have tons of sources of information. We have either uh, data from experimentation. We have a lot of publicly available data. Uh, it's, it's not clear how to use this altogether. Uh, and there would be different, uh, let's say, value coming from experimentation and, and uh, publicly available data, uh, mainly because one is you can be it can be measured in your own population. So it's related. Uh, it's close to the animals you you want to estimate breeding values for uh, and, and public elev publicly available data. You probably have it in much bigger volumes, but they may or may not be interesting for your uh, your population or your uh, your case use case. The results that we get until now show that uh, using function annotation, it's, it's, uh, it delivers really trait and tissue dependent results. So we, we used uh, CAT scores and methylation scores until now independently. Uh, and they show exactly this. Uh, some traits we can actually get a lot well, more accuracy when compared to the traditional GBLOP. Some others we actually lose accuracy. And as uh, as just presented, uh, next steps for us now is using multiple function annotations uh, in the same model. Uh, and we're trying this with with the Fed scores, but the idea is to uh, to build up from that uh, and come up with a new approach. Yeah, and that's it for me. Yes, thank you so much. Super interesting. Um, I don't know if there are any questions right now. Uh, if there are, um, we can't see you right now, Bruno. So maybe if there are questions, it's nice if we can also see you. Um, you should see me. Stop sharing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, just to stop sharing. Um, yes. Oh, there. Yeah. So very interestingly, the sounds seem to come from yeah. Marco's account even though you were talking. So that's why we didn't see you, I think. Oh, okay. um, are there any questions for the moment? Or is anyone, everyone still uh, waiting for their smart questions for the end? Which is all fine, of course. Mm 
nothing popped up right now. So then uh, we'll go to the last presentation and then uh, return for the discussion at the end. Thank you so much. Okay, that brings us to Andrea, I think. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Lee in the right screen. Perfect. Excellent. Well, We're off to a good start. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for the, this opportunity to present our, our work to you. So um, I'm going to be following up on those nice presentations from, uh, from Mario and Bruno with um, some related work within the Gene Switch project. Um, to begin, just a quick introduction of myself. So my name is Andrea Rao. Um, I'm a researcher at INRAE in France, um, just outside of Paris. And um, I come for originally from biostatistics background, and I've been um, involved in the Gene Switch project in particular with some methodological development related to genomic prediction. And what I'm going to present today is some early results that we have um, in collaboration with Irini, who's also here on the call, about trying to deploy the, the models that we built within GeneSwitch on, um, on some, some poultry data. Um, so to begin, you'll find this slide very familiar. Um, and I wanted to situate exactly where uh, my talk fits in with this work, work package for um, that you've already um, seen some of the work on in the, the previous two talks. So in particular, um, what I'll be dis discussing today uh, in two parts is the first part, which is related specifically to the, the models that we sought to develop within GeneSwitch um, that were able to handle the functional annotations that we were uh, preparing to, to work on that were uh, developed as part of the project. Um, and in a second step, uh, this, this work that we've done more recently with Irini, trying to make use of those models um, for some early steps on the level two validation within GeneSwitch, um, specifically on the, the commercial poultry data. Um, so, this part one, um, we've already seen genomic prediction in a nutshell. Um, Mario gave a, an excellent introduction to the, the context of genomic prediction models. And indeed, the objective is to eventually select the, the best animals for reproduction so as to obtain genetic improvement, as uh, Bruno mentioned, um, of the population on traits of interest. So in many cases, um, we are indeed based on a, a simple linear model where we're looking to predict um, uh, uh, essentially a, a, a vector Y based on potentially a set of covariates. And then we have, um, importantly, our matrix of genotypes X, which will be associated with a vector of coefficients beta. So this beta uh, coefficient vector is going to be the one that we're trying to get um, uh, good estimates of so as to obtain the, the best possible um, estimates of our, our vector Y as possible. And as already mentioned um, with genomic prediction, what will be happening is that we'll be training this model on a training set of data, so on a reference population for which there are um, genotypes as well as uh, trait, va uh, trait values that are available. Um, and then this trained model will be able to be used on a set of validation data for which only genotypes are available. Um, so within uh, the task that I was involved in in Gene Switch, and in particular with uh, Fanny Molandin, who is a former PhD student working on this project, uh, we decided to stay within the realm of Bayesian methods for genomic prediction. And very rapidly, uh, Bayesian methods, what they refer to are uh, these statistical approaches that seek to balance a set of prior knowledge, prior distributions, with the likelihood of the data, given whatever set of parameters we're, we're estimating, uh, and, and this balance is achieved uh, to, to be able to estimate a set of, of a posterior distribution. So trying to, to put these two aspects together, which essentially uh, at least to a normalizing constant um, uh, co corresponds to a product of the, of the likelihood and the, the, these prior distributions. So the reason I'm even speaking about um, Bayesian methods in the first place is that essentially what you need to know is that if we're working with a, a simple linear model framework, um, often we're assuming we're in the, the, the world of Gaussian distributions, so a likelihood will have a, a Gaussian distribution behind it. 
And the, the big question that's often posed within the context of genomic prediction models is what to use for these prior distributions that define sort of our prior um, knowledge about the parameters of this model. And these parameters typically include variance parameters, as well as these beta coefficients I've already referred to that correspond to the uh, effects of the different genetic variants in our model. And the, the big focus is how to choose this prior distribution for the beta vector in a way that is uh, both sufficiently realistic, so it sufficiently reflects a trait's genetic architecture, while at the same time remaining in the realm of computational feasibility. So if we uh, are in a, a GBLOOP model, a, a simple linear model where we're assuming a constant variance for all the, the genetic uh, variants in our in our model. Um, we're in sort of the, the extreme case of having an extremely computationally feasible model, but has a fairly strong uh, belief in how the effects of those variants are distributed across the genome. So the other extreme of having a model that would be completely computationally infeasible would be one in which we allow each variant to have its own uh, independent variance that's estimated. And in that case, we're multiplying by a large number uh, the, the parameters that there are to estimate in the model. So essentially what we'll be thinking about with these Bayesian methods for genomic prediction is how to find a, a strike a balance essentially um, between those two extremes. So it turns out that about 10 years ago or so, um, there was a, a model that was developed in, as an extension of the so-called Bayesian alphabet. So there's a whole range of Bayesian models that have made uh, um, various assumptions about the, the distribution of, uh, of these beta values across the genome. And this Bayes R approach was an interesting one because it essentially um, decided to model the distribution of these variant effects as a mixture of four possibilities. So the idea here is that these, these variant effects can either be null, have a small, a medium, or a large effect in the construction of the, of the trait that we're trying to, to predict. So mathematically, uh, very briefly, how that uh, pans out is that we essentially write this prior distribution for our variant effects, beta, as this mixture of a null, small, medium, and large component. Um, beyond that, then, because we're in the, the world of Bayesian models, that means that we're in a world where we have to have uh, a fairly um, uh, computationally uh, intensive estimation procedure where there's sort of a sampling from the posterior distribution that has to happen. We won't go into the details here, um, but the idea is because we only have these four components to worry about estimating, we're, we still have the flexibility of allowing for a variety of different effects among our genetic variants, um, while not allowing that complexity to get uh, too strong. So the reason I'm talking about Bayes R in particular is that there was an interesting extension of the Bayes R model called the Bayes R C model um, that essentially uh, wanted to build on the possibility of having prior categorizations of genetic variants that were known uh, before running the, the genomic prediction model. The idea being essentially that if we have a case where there are say three different categories of SNPs, um, I might have one category of variants that corresponds to variants that are um, close to genes that are known for a given uh, characteristic uh, of interest or um, SNPs that are known to be located in the promoter region of, of certain genes and so on. Uh, I, I might be interested in trying to uh, allow there to be varying proportions of null, low, medium, and high SNPs within each of those independent categories. So in the, the schematic illustration on this uh, slide, what you see is that perhaps the annotation category de, two, <laughs> mixing French and English, the annotation category two um, here has a larger proportion of medium to high effect SNPs, so likely an annotation category that would be more closely related uh, to the, the trait that we're trying to predict. So this Bayes RC model uh, essentially is going to fit a Bayes R model independently to each of these annotation categories, so it's a factorization uh, of the genetic variants across the genomes according to these groupings that we'll have fixed as, a, as the user of, of the model. Um, and, and then the, the, the model proceeds in the exact same way as the Bayes R approach. Uh, 
So one thing to keep in mind is that this Bayes RC approach is assuming that these annotations are completely disjoint. So each variant will belong to one and only one of these annotation categories. So if I were to summarize in a perhaps a more visual way the differences between these different models, um, well, we can start by thinking about the Bayes R approach is essentially fitting this, this idea of having a, a pie chart of null, low, medium, high effects among all the SNPs that I have access to in my genotyping data. So typically we're assuming a very large proportion of null SNPs that so we're essentially removing from the model, removing that noise that, that Bruno had referred to. Um, and then to a lesser, uh, a greater or lesser degree, having um, SNPs that are assigned to low, medium, and high effects. Um, with respect to the Bayes RC approach that we saw just a moment ago, the idea is that we might have these categories that we have predefined ahead of time based on some prior knowledge. So in this illustration, I have, for example, that we might have some SNPs that are known for being GWAS hits or others that come from a, a database like Animal QTLDB. And what the Bayes RC approach will then do is within each of these groups of SNPs that are in the orange grouping or the yellow grouping or in neither, so as my gray grouping of, of other SNPs, will be allowing there to be a variety of different proportions of null to high effect SNPs. Um, so what we've seen is that um, in terms of the annotations that are generated within uh, the gene switch project or that could be generated with these faith scores, the CAD scores and so on, is if we um, multiply the number of annotation categories that we'll consider, we're also multiplying the likelihood that we'll have variants that potentially have multiple annotations. And up to this point, the, the Bayes RC approach is unable to handle such cases because we're requiring there to be a disjoint categorization of, of the variants in our model. So our, our question that we spent some time thinking about within uh, the gene switch project is what, how best to uh, account for these, these variants that might have multiple annotations. And what we decided is that the, the, these overlapping annotations can potentially have uh, different interpretations according to how we form or how we define the annotation categories. Um, and according to which uh, interpretation, we might have a different uh, modeling approach that we would like to take. Specifically, um, what Fanny did during her PhD is to, to develop a software called Bayes RCO for overlapping categories that allows for two different types of models according to two different types of hypotheses about how uh, annotations are expected to affect the likelihood of a SNP to uh, contribute to a traits, uh, traits construction. So on the one hand, we may have a case where a genetic variant has two annotations here, uh, a blue annotation representing accessible chromatin in the embryo liver, and the yellow is a hit from a, a database that we might have pulled elsewhere. And in this case, we might wonder whether uh, the first or the second annotation is more pertinent uh, in, in terms of uh, building a, a model with strong prediction abilities. So the first approach that Fanny developed was the Bayes RC Pi approach that essentially tries to model um, this uncertainty and assign for each multi-annotated variant um, one annotation or the other. On the other hand, we may have cases where the more annotations that are present for a given variant, the stronger our likelihood that that variant does indeed contribute something meaningful to the construction of our trait. Um, so in such a case, what we might want to do instead is to model a cumulative effect of those two annotations, which we achieved through a, a model that we called the Bayes RC plus model. So in fact, uh, these, these two models that are implemented within the Bayes RCO software are not uh, really in competition with one another. It's more two different uh, alternatives according to the, the meaning that we assign to these overlapping annotation categories. But I won't spend too much more detail on the, the actual definition of those models. Instead, I'll move to part two of my talk, which was trying to deploy the use, uh, trying to deploy these uh, Bayes RCO models on some commercial scale poultry data to just get some initial steps in terms of, of validation. Um, so for this part, what we're working with is uh, genotype data from uh, 47K autosomal SNPs in a set of uh, almost 61,000 uh, chickens for which we have records available for, for body weight. 
And what I really did in this part is to make use of the Bayes RC Pi approach that I uh, presented just a moment ago, um, and to perform genomic prediction on, on, a, on these data that have been split into training and test sets. So in each case, we're going to do 10 random splits of, of these 61,000 chickens um, to have a training set of about 48,000 and a test set of about 12,000 animals. And we'll repeat this split 10 times to try to evaluate the, the variance of, of our results across different uh, randomizations. So that gives us our, our genotype and phenotype data that we're using to construct our models. Um, then what we'll talk about is how to categorize our, our variants. Um, so which annotations should we make use of um, in, in this portion? And as an initial uh, idea, one way to categorize the SNPs here is to make use of uh, annotation available from the Ensemble Variant Effect Predictor tool. Um, which is trying to get at um, predicting the impact of, of different variants according to their location with respect to known uh, genome annotation. Um, and essentially, the it's early results that I'm presenting here today, and our, our major question that we were first asking is to what extent the granularity of these uh, SNP categories impacts the downstream results. Um, the uh, variant effect predictor tool and ensemble is essentially categorizing SNPs according to their location within the genome. So you see here a, a visualization of all the different categories that are possible in terms of uh, location with respect to, to exons, introns, uh, transcription factor binding sites, and so on. So as an initial result, one thing we can look at is among those 47,000 uh, autosomal SNPs that we're working with for our genomic prediction, on the left-hand side, we have the numbers of variants that are assigned to each of the 21 annotation categories I presented on the previous slide. So you can see that there are a large number, uh, unsurprisingly, of these variants that fall into introns, about 33,000, um, with some of the annotation categories containing a, a relatively small number uh, of variants, such as coding sequence variants. There's only, only three variants. Um, note also that it is possible for SNPs to be assigned to multiple categories um, with this variant effect uh, predictor tool. And uh, in order to examine the impact of the granularity of the categories, what we did is collapse these 21 annotation categories into a broader set of five based on a sequence ontology. So that means we come down now to a, a much uh, broader set of, of variant annotation categories, which again will have a, a considerable number of, of overlaps, but to try to get at to what extent one or the other of these strategy, strategies um, impacts results. So we'll start with the first look of the, the fine annotation. So looking at the 21 annotation categories. And what you see here is uh, 10 different splits of our data into test and uh, training data. And we're looking at the correlation of the GBVs with the phenotypic values in each of the, the 10 sets. So we're working with a validation set of just over 12,000 samples here. Um, and what you see here is we're we have pretty consistent results across the 10 uh, splits of the data, around 43% 43, uh, 43 correlation, um, which we can represent for one of the data sets here, the random data set four on the right, where we have GEBVs on the X versus phenotypic values on the, on the Y. And we can compare this result to the following results, which is um, instead on the, the broad annotations, so collapsing those 21 down to a set of five. And again, we have the same information here represented on this slide. And we see that, in fact, the, the prediction results are very similar between the two models. We're still at about 43% uh, uh, prediction accuracy. So in this case, it seems that uh, splitting down the, the annotations into broader versus finer categories has fairly small impact on the results. So these are just early, uh, early results because there's many analyses that are still ongoing. But my take home messages here are that within GeneSwitch, we developed this Bayes RCO software, um, which is a flexible Bayesian genomic prediction model that has been explicitly designed to account for overlapping annotation categories. And these initial validation results have showed first that the Bayes RCO model can be used on commercial scale data. So we had about 60,000 animals in total um, in this data set. And up to now, we had been primarily validating the, the model on, on smaller data sets. So that's uh, promising. We also showed that it, 
for this particular data set and this particular uh, definition of annotation categories, the finer granularity of those predicted variant effects do not appear to strongly affect results. But there are, of course, some limitations to the, the analysis here. So for example, the, the analysis was performed using a 47K SNP data. Um, but as already mentioned by Mario, we expect there to be greater added value from annotations expected uh, when we use the whole genome sequencing resolution, even though, as Bruno showed, the, sometimes that gain isn't so, so strong between a higher density and, and lower density genotyping. And finally, the, the choice of annotation categories is, is a real question that uh, there's no easy answer to. Um, what we focused on here was just looking at different granularities of predicted variant effects, but uh, ideally we'll be looking at how the uh, gene switch uh, functional annotation maps can, uh, can provide uh, potentially additional information. So that's it for me. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. I have to say I'm a little bit in over my head right here been out of it for a little bit so uh, I have uh, my, my brain is churning after all these numbers um, are there any questions from the people for either Andrea or for the other speakers of today feel free to speak up or put anything in the chat if you like in the meanwhile I have a question because we are here in collaboration with the European Master of Animal Breeding and Genetics, and we are hearing about all these, well, new developments in research. Um, I think this one is for all speakers. Um, all the people that are currently in this field as early, early career scientists or are still in their education, um, are there specific things they should focus on or um, research developments that are interested to interesting to include in their curriculum to focus on? What are your ideas on that? Is, is this, well, I don't know if I'm the for best everyone, the for position everyone. to, yeah. I'll, I'll let my fellow speakers contribute. Um, I, I, so I, as I said, I'm from a statistics background and you can see that the, all the talks here have made use of of some pretty sophisticated statistical methods. So I, I can only encourage people to continue getting training on that point. In the meanwhile, we also do see a question in that question box. I don't know if you can see it too, Andrea, but it says, why did you not use the base RC plus method? Yeah, we could have. I, it was, again, these were sort of initial results. The, the Bayes RC Pi method is the, the one that focuses on sort of accounting for the uncertainty and the importance of effects. And that seemed um, not unreasonable given the, the categories defined using the ensemble tool, but it would certainly uh, could potentially be interesting to, to explore the Bayes RC plus approach as well. So you might be potentially using that in the future. So if, if you do, people should follow you to uh, stay around for those results or? It's possible, yeah. I, I don't actually, in, in our comparisons on simulated data and other data sets, we, we didn't often see a very strong difference in results between the two proposed uh, models. And one other um, one other limitation is that the Bayes RC plus approach is even more computationally intensive, especially when there are a large number of annotation categories. Um, so that, that that's definitely a question as well. Um, any more questions? Mm -hmm. Don't see anything popping up. Mm. Can I ask if a there... question to Andrea? Sorry? Can I ask a question to Andrea? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. There you go. You, you presented the results uh, on accuracy for the um, using annotations. Uh, what were the accuracies without the annotations? Uh, that, uh, Irini, I don't know if you have an answer to that question about, did, did you try without annotations as well? It's kind of benchmark. Uh, no, we didn't try actually. Um, Is it possible yes. that it's software or? Maybe uh, we can use um, 
just one category for that to check the results because I think that we have to build the matrix. Does that uh, help you, uh, Marco? Yep. <laughs> I have another look if anyone has come up with a question. If not, I, I have, well, it's not really a question. It was more, I, I enjoyed seeing Bruno and, and Marco's results because um, we've been, we tried out the, the Bayes RC plus and PI uh, models on, on the same set of data with sort of different ways of constructing annotations. And I just wanted to say, I'm a bit reassured because as we've talked about between us, we have very similar results in the sense that there's a difficult uh, to establish a clear pattern about where and when and why and how annotations improve results. And it comes back to different uh, function annotations will probably affect different traits and, and it makes sense differently, right? So if, if we use function annotations from different tissues, for example, some tissues will be much more related to efficiency than uh, reproduction or things like this. So, yeah. Well, um, oh, Gabor, I see a hand. Just a quick question on the on the thing, so that uh, so Ginswitch focuses on well on, on pigs and poultry. Uh, uh, well, I was just thinking. So, uh, well, these methods that you are developing and dealing with are they kind of limited to some uh, or basically these these uh, species in in some way, or it is like like totally open, including, for example, I don't know wildlife or, or all these kinds. So, so like it's totally everything goes. Uh, human research uh, also the, well uh, it's definitely applicable to other livestock species I mean uh, there's nothing particular about pigs and poultry that makes these uh, methods applicable here and not elsewhere um, I think if you go to a wildlife species or humans maybe the added benefit is actually expected to be larger because those species are, um, they don't have the same small effective population sizes in livestock, which is for genomic prediction accuracy, it's a blessing on one hand, right? But then you reach a certain level and you can't, it's difficult to, to get beyond that due to the high LD, right? That's also why we saw there's very little benefit from going to whole genome sequence data, where there's potentially, if you have higher, uh, effective population sizes, there's more benefit in increasing your resolutions there. So, okay, thank you. I can even add in, in uh, for plants as well. I think their crop um, colleagues at Inraya have made use of some of the models we've developed. And yeah, I, I think there's the the real limitation is just having the available data. So if if you're working in in a species that has available Genotype, phenotype, and ideally solid annotations. And the the models we've developed are generic. And... Okay. Thank you so much. It's great to hear. It's very interesting, actually. Um, if we don't have any additional questions, um, I mean, this is recorded. We're going to post the recording online. You'll see the presentations again. Um, the contacts will be in there too. So if any questions pop up later. Um, you can uh, contact the speakers of today personally. Um, I promised you a link at the beginning for the PicWeb Junior community for early career researchers. I'm dropping it in the chat now. And then the final thing I want to say is that you shouldn't forget about the next webinar, um, Epigenetics. So register for that one online as soon as possible. And then I want to thank you for your participation today. And I hope to see you all next time. <laughs>